Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to today's RSA professional development webinar. Thank you for, for joining us um, today. My name is Daniela Karl. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive at the Regional Studies Association. And today's session is one webinar within a small series that's organized in partnership between the Regional Studies Association and the Young Academics Network of the Association of European Planning Schools, or ASOP. The focus of the three webinars is to um, highlight how to navigate between um, being a PhD student and becoming an early career researcher. The webinars will provide insights from a number of speakers and on three very distinguished topics. Today's session is on effective grant application writing and will address a number of aspects that should be considered when you um, apply for a grant. So there's on, on one hand the content of your application, then there is what help would be available. This is, of course, depending on where in the world you are and, and what support your university offers. And um, finally, the third presentation will look at the audience the research is for. So that's something also to take into account. The second webinar in the series um, will take place tomorrow and focus on career transition from being a PhD student to early career researchers researcher and the third webinar is in April and focus on mental health and well-being in academia. My colleague Nicola will share information on the um, other webinars later on in the chat box. Some housekeeping before we start. So this webinar um, is recorded and will be made available um, via the RSA lounge. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&R box. We will have time for questions at the end of the session after the presentations. Please give us a hello and, and tell us where you um, from where in the world you are joining us in the chat box. We like to see that. Um, and in case you are on X, formerly known as Twitter, please use the hashtag, hashtag RSA webinar to tweet about the event. Okay, let me share my, my screen for um, a short presentation on the RSA, if you're new to the RSA. Um, we, um, we are a global interdisciplinary network um, for urban and regional research development and policy. We support our members with latest research via our suite of publications. We currently have um, six um, journals, two book series, um, a blog and an online magazine. We have a portfolio of knowledge and exchange training and capacity building activities, and we facilitate global networks. So there's a lot going on in the RSA. We are also a micro funder. So our grants are not huge, but they are able to change careers and, and help you to get larger grants, as you um, will hear later in the session. Hang on. So, um, we also um, give um, excellence awards. So we have awards for um, recent master students. We have um, awards for current PhD students, and we have awards for early career researchers. Early career researchers for us are researchers who are within five years after finishing their, their PhD. Um, the application is straightforward, and the next deadline for all these um, awards is the 22nd of April. And I encourage you to, to consider applying for these. As mentioned, we, we do offer a number of um, grant schemes. These are for individuals, for example, at different career stages. We have the early career grant. Again, they are for researchers within five years after finishing their PhD. Um, up to £10,000, and they are for a, a research project that can span up to um, 18 months. The, the deadline for this is the 13th of May. We also have um, a membership research grant, which is for individual members, so it's not um, available for, for student members or early career members, but in case you are um, more mid-career, then this might be of interest. Um, you can get more information on these grants via the QR code that's on the slide or 
on our website, of course. Again, the, the deadline there is also 13th of May. We have a um, fellowship grant scheme, which is for fellows of the RSA. So if you've been active for a minimum of five years within the association, um, you will be um, awarded the fellowship status and you can then apply for the um, for this grant scheme. The uh, deadline is also 13th of May. And then the, uh, the fourth grant scheme on here is the um, travel grant scheme, which is for attending non-RSA events. Um, and it's up to 500 pounds um, supporting your travel costs application there. There are two deadlines per year. One is 16th of May and then 19th of September. Again, more details via the QR codes. Um, we also do um, conference bursaries. These are conference fee waivers um, for our larger conferences. So for example, for our annual conference, we just um, awarded 10 um, bursaries to um, mainly student and early career um, delegates. We do have grant schemes also for teams of researchers. We have the research network grant scheme, which funds costs related to organizing events, bringing people together who are interested in a certain topic to discuss this. Um, we just recently had um, a research network approved by the board, which was um, submitted by PhD students and early career researchers. So you can be a PhD student and apply for, for this grant scheme. That's no problem at all. The value for this is up to £10,000 and the, the deadline is in the autumn on the 24th of October. And then finally, we have the Policy Expo um, grant scheme, which supports um, policy facing research. Um, so if your research will be applicable um, for policymakers, then I encourage you to look at this. There's currently no um, deadline advertised as yet, but I would suspect there will be one in the autumn this year. So keep this in mind if your work has a policy focus. In addition to all this, um, we run this webinar series, which is the professional development webinar series. And over the years, we started this in in um, May 2020. We um, we put together um, a long list of resources. So we currently have 52 um, short videos that cover these topics. So we have several videos on academic writing and publishing. Um, addressing different aspects of this, engaging with policymakers, presentation skills, career development, research methods, grants and funding, networking, network management. So um, I encourage you to have a look at the RSA Lounge for, for these resources that are there. These are short videos, half an hour long and to the point, and it's well, well worth um, checking them out. And finally, and in case you are not signed up yet, I recommend signing up for our monthly e-bulletin. So in the e-bulletin, um, we highlight everything that's going on in the RSA, any support we offer, any grants that are coming up, any activities and more. Um, Alex is currently working on the on the next edition, which will be published tomorrow. So if you sign up today, you will receive this still. Okay, yes, you can um, scan the QR code to, to sign up to this e-bulletin. So this was my um, short overview about the RSA. Let me welcome today's um, session co-moderator, um, Sila Sharon Varis Huzar, who's a postdoc researcher at the Slovak University of Technology, Slovakia in Slovakia, and part of the ASOP Young Academics Network coordination team. Welcome, Sharon. The floor is yours um, to introduce ASOP. Thank you so much, Daniela, for the great start and uh, thanks for this fruitful cooperation between two associations. So in the meantime, I will be sharing my slides. Yes. Okay. So. Yes. So uh, let me shortly introduce myself uh, before going into uh, detail on how uh, we work as a network. My name is Jeran and I'm an urban planner and a postdoctoral researcher. And I am the current representative of ESOP Young Academics Network. 
ESOP, uh, in short, uh, is that Association of European Schools of Planning. And ESOP has been promoting excellence in planning education and planning research since uh, 1987 and uh, has built an incredible network of planners all around the world and now having 250 institutional members and 50 individual members. And as for the Young Academics Network, uh, we are a branch of ESOP founded in 2003, comparatively a younger uh, network, which encourages the active participation and exchange of academic work from master's students to postdoc, early career researchers, for those starting out in uh, academic positions. And the Young Academics Network provides a platform through which the academic leaders of tomorrow can share ideas today in an open and inclusive environment and challenging and at the same time supporting one another in the attainment of superior academic output. So what are our uh, main goals? The core aims are the first one is creating a network of young academics and the organization of activities. And uh, the second one is facilitating access to the ESOP, the main uh, association structures and voicing the young academics needs within the ESOP. And where, where to find us? Uh, you can find us online on various platforms, uh, including our official website, where you can subscribe for free, uh, become a member, create a profile, take part in the uh, coordination team elections, and start networking. And uh, act we are actively also engaged with our community on social media, such as LinkedIn, Facebook, previously known Twitter, X, and Instagram. So feel free to connect with us and be part of our uh, vibrant community. And uh, since 2007, we have uh, consist consistently upheld the uh, tradition of hosting the Young Academics Conference, uh, which is uh, based on uh, years. Each year we have one. And just last week, we successfully uh, co-organized the 18th y uh, YA conference titled Bridging Gaps, Urban Planning for Coexistence in collaboration with the PhD students uh, from Politecnico di Milano, Italy. So the opportunities are endless, endless and uh, just drop us an email, check our website. And uh, for this uh, webinar series, we are so pleased as uh, Ease of Young Academics uh, Network has teamed up with the Regional Studies Association to deliver this uh, three webinars as uh, Daniela has mentioned. These sessions aim to address these three current and highly important issues. And we want to, uh, young academics, early career researchers to benefit from this. So I hope you will enjoy uh, today's, uh, the first uh, webinar and don't forget to sign up for the upcoming two seminars. We will be uh, again, like uh, telling you the, where, where you can uh, apply. And the next one will be tomorrow. And the third one will be on 25th of April. So thank you, and I will give uh, the floor to Daniela. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, and thank you for everyone who uh, who tells us where they join us from. I love this. Turkey, Germany, Poland, very international today, which is great. Now it's time to um, move to our speakers. As said, we have um, three speakers today, and the... Uh, um, they will present and then there will be time for questions. Please add your questions to the Q&A box. And if they are addressed to a certain speaker, then please let us know. So the first speaker today is um, Paula Prenzel. Paula Prenzel is um, Assistant Professor of Regional Development at the University of Greifswald in the Northeast of Germany. Um, Paula has experiences um, in successful grant application, is currently an early career grant holder, that's an um, RSA early career grant. She's also a principal investigator in two projects funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research and a member of the RSA Research Committee and therefore reviews um, applications that come in for um, RSA grants. Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Daniela, and the kind words. Sounds uh, like I have so much experience with grant writing when you say it like this. Um, I will just share my slides before starting. Uh, so you should now be able to see this. Um, yes, I um, have just aged out of the early career stage uh, of uh, the RSA, so I am still 
I still count myself as a relatively early career and I want to share some experiences that I have made in sort of getting to, getting started with grant applications. Um, and like probably many of the people listening to this, um, I never really thought about grants during my PhD. It was not something on the menu. It was not something that we were doing. Um, and so I was confronted with this new challenge um, once I started to work as an assistant professor. And in the beginning, I was really overwhelmed because it is an overwhelming progress process and it is new and different. So what I want to talk about in like 10 minutes today is why it's a bit different and how you can maybe practice this new academic writing skill that you maybe haven't had a chance to try out so much yet. So in my opinion, grant writing is not paper writing, and it's really important to realize that it isn't, um, because otherwise we we write and think about it maybe in an, in an unhelpful way. So I made a, a list of, of how journal papers and, and grant applications differ, and this is not an exclusive list, but some things that are very different is when you write a journal article, you're trying to report what you've done, um, whereas if you write a grant application, you're trying to write about what is worth doing. So one is much more future focused and the other is much more like retrospective where you're trying to report on something that's already done, um, which also means grant applications give you more freedom to think into the future. Um, for journal articles, we're always trying to write about one precise and small research question. We're really trying to narrow it down, but grant applications can be quite big. Not all of them are. Sometimes the grants are small and then they're actually similar to one research question in a paper, but they could also span several years. So you might have a project running three years, even five years, and then you have much more different research questions. So you need to plan differently than when you're planning a paper. Journal articles, when we write, you're trying to be impersonal. It's all about the research. It's about what you've done. It's all about being rep replicable and, 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 and clear. Um, when you're writing a grant application, you're not just trying to showcase your brilliant idea, but also your brilliant self. So you're trying to showcase yourself as a researcher along with your idea, which means sometimes you might have to provide a CV. Often you have to sort of show that you've already got some expertise in this area that you're trying to research. Sometimes you might even be asked to say why this grant is important for you in your career. So this is much more personal and style of writing than is a journal article. And also journal articles are very, very detailed. We pride ourselves on writing very detailed literature and method and result sections and limitations. Whereas in grant applications, there's a balance. On the one hand, you're trying to show enough details to motivate your research and to show that it's actually valuable, um, realistic, and also feasible, um, and that you are able to, to even do this research. But on the other hand, the more details you provide, the more you lock yourself into something that you then have to do exactly like this. So when you're writing a grant, you're often trying to keep some flexibility. You're not trying to be too detailed because things might happen, things might change. You might not know yet everything that you need to know in order to do research in one specific way. Um, also, while you want to acknowledge limitations and problems in your research to show that it's realistic, you don't want to really undermine your idea and make it seem weaker than it is. So there is sort of a different tone in rent writing than in paper writing. And I think that's important to realize. So when you're starting to write a grant application, how can you practice? How can you get better at this? And here are a couple of tips, I don't know, ideas, things that I've done and I found useful um, in getting, to use, getting used to writing grants. Um, number one tip would be to work with others. Um, if you have the chance, consider collaborators. Um, for me, that was really helpful, especially for the larger grant applications that I was a part of, um, to have experienced colleagues that I could ask about a lot of the details of how to do this, um, having somebody to discuss uh, and go back and forth with on, on ideas and on arguments, um, I thought was very useful. Although you also have to keep in mind, especially as an early career researcher, collaborators can also be a risk because you want to make sure that you stand out as the person who brought the idea and you don't want to lose um, perhaps your input in working or in, in, a, in a larger group and sort of get lost in, in the whole process. Um, even if you don't have anybody to collaborate with on a grant or the grant is actually just a, an individual grant for one person, um, you still should try and 
talk to other people. So pitch your ideas to trusted colleagues, to friends, to family, to anybody who will listen. Um, because the more you talk to people, the more you are comfortable with your research and the more used you are, you get to uh, presenting your ideas. Um, I would advise to not just do this with people who are in your precise field. So other experts on your topic, but also to other people, because the reviewers might not be precisely from your research field. Oftentimes we review things that are broadly related to our research, but not exactly our research. Um, so in order to sort of make sure that you are also understandable for more generalist approaches, it's really useful to talk to others. Um, finally, I think for every writing that's not just for grant writing, find some critical proofreaders that can never hurt. Another thing that I think is very useful when you're starting to write a grant is make sure that you understand the application process. And that is also a little bit different from journal writing, perhaps. There are a lot of formal requirements. Grant applications are, are very formalized. Uh, there's deadlines, forms, materials that you need to hand in. And all of these things, it's important to make sure you understand them. Um, there's usually guidelines on how to do this. Like, for example, for the Early Career Research Grant from the RSA, there's a whole handbook um, and there's a lot of information in there about who the grant is for, what it's supposed to do, um, how to apply for it, and all of these things are in there. So make sure you study sort of the accompanying requirements very um, closely. And if something is unclear, that's the other nice thing, you can ask for clarification. Most application grant applications that I've experienced, people were very happy to provide answers to questions on details about the process. Um, it's definitely true for the RSA. It's also true for some of the other projects that I've applied with. You can ask if something is unclear. Um, another idea might be to find examples of how other people have written applications. You can find examples in general. Maybe you can even find specific examples for exactly the grant application that you are applying to as well. For example, on the website for the RSA, you can find who has gotten these grants before and you even find small descriptions on their projects. So I found that very useful when I was applying to sort of see, get inspired by the scale, for example, of other people's projects and compare whether my idea was sort of the similar scale or too big, too small. Um, lastly, use resources, but you're already doing this if you're watching this webinar, so I don't need to say much about this, but there is a lot of information out there. There are also other RSA webinars on grant writing that are very good and that I found very helpful, for example, with Heike Maya and Davide Luca and with Juan Boschma. So there's a lot of information out there that you can use. Once you're in the thick of writing um, your application, and now maybe I'm switching a little bit more into the also the reviewer role of early career grants, you should think about how you're presenting a game plan and you should have a game plan. What I mean with that is you should be clear on what you're trying to achieve. So you should be able to communicate the outcomes of your research and the reviewer should be able to see them from your application. Um, on the one hand, that means in general, the research contribution, what are you trying to add to the knowledge, but also the more tangible outcomes. Are you trying to write papers? Are you trying to write a book? Are you creating a new data set? What are the things that you're actually doing in this project? Um, and also, along with the outcomes, you should think about how you're actually trying to spend the grant. Um, because yes, it's about research, but it's also about money. And we need to know what the money is being spent on. So you should think about what do you need for your research outcomes to succeed? How does this grant support this? Um, and what steps do you need to take in order to get where you need to go? So as a reviewer, you might wonder, does this advance our knowledge? Is this a good idea? And oftentimes it is a really, really good idea. But then there's also the question, is this realistic and is it well planned? So is this actually acceptable to this plan? Um, so both of these questions are important when we assess applications. Finally, don't get discouraged. Um, grants are super competitive and everyone experiences rejection. Um, it's just the nature of this process. It's part skill-based and part lottery-based really. Um, so don't get discouraged when, I'm not even gonna say if, when you get rejected um, for something because we all do at some point. Um, so instead try and consider maybe whether you got any feedback, what you, what you can do with it. So is it possible to change your research? Is it a problem of your idea? Is it a problem of your plan? Is it a problem of the fit between your idea and the specific call for applications? Is there somewhere else where you might want to submit instead? Or could you resubmit? Some grant applications allow you to resubmit even after changing things. Um, so this is a process that you might just want to take advantage of. 
in general, some takeaways from my personal experience. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that this is a different type of writing and that it needs practice and that you're not going to be perfect at it, just like we all weren't perfect when we started writing journal articles or any other type of writing um, and still aren't perfect, probably. Um, so use the resources that you have, learn from others, use the knowledge in your network, um, but also try and make sure that you understand all the formal requirements around the application. Um, make sure you plan, think big, but also plan uh, very realistically. Um, so you can actually sell your project not only as novel and really valuable, but also as feasible. Um, and lastly, try different things, because I'm sure there's tons of ways to be successful in grant writing. Um, and don't take the rejection to heart, but rather try again until it works. Um, so those would be my personal tips. I'm curious to hear what others have to also say about this later. Great. Thank you very much, Paula. This was packed with with super useful tips and advice. I mean, I love the, the comparison at the beginning where you showed the difference in, in writing style and then the message to stay positive. I mean, this is something for academics in general. I mean, it's not just grants, it's journals, articles and so on. You know, I mean, it's you need to make the most out of it, even out of a rejection and see the positives and um, don't give up. Okay, as said earlier, thank you, Paula, again. Um, as said earlier, we have the questions later on. So if you guys have questions, put them in the Q and R and a Q and A, and then we we cover them later on. Our second speaker is um, Dieter Kogler. Dieter is joining us from the University College in Dublin, where he's academic director of the Spatial Dynamics Lab and an associate professor in economic geography at the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Poly policy. He's recently been, um, which is now many years ago, I remember when I started with the RSA, um, I think that was, he's recently been, a, or in the past, an early career grant holder and used the study um, he did then as a um, pilot for um, then applying for an uh, um, European Research Council starter grant and he was successful with this. He leads a Science Foundation Ireland funded um, research Project, project at the moment, and he will tell us all about this. Dieter, it's over to you. Thank you, Daniela, for the kind introduction and uh, for organizing all of this. And of course, to Alex, Nikki, and uh, Swena uh, for, for putting those uh, webinars together. I think they are super useful uh, for, for everybody uh, engaging in this. Uh, as you said, I I was very successful in the past with applying for funding. Uh, I had an ERC. It's finished now, uh, just finished. Uh, in parallel, I also did a large scale study for the Science Foundation Island. But uh, of course, it was the smaller grants up front. As you mentioned, the RSA uh, early career grant uh, that really allowed me to excel uh, to those larger grants. So. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, I will uh, today talk a little bit about uh, uh, in terms of managing grant. Now, this seems a like, little bit uh, putting the, the card in front of the horse as we're talking about grant application writing uh, specifically today. But I think there's certain considerations that uh, Paul already hinted in terms of uh, thinking through uh, how do you spend the money, what will be required, and so on. I mean, once the funding application goes in, it's out of your hands. Uh, once it's approved, they most likely go back to exactly what we wrote in there. Uh, so there's very little room for maneuver once a, a grant is approved and awarded in terms of asking for, for extra funds, for shifting funds and so on. So finances, people, physical infrastructure. Uh, then I will also uh, speak a little bit uh, concerning day-to-day -day tasks and uh, reporting. Uh, so something to, to keep in mind again, uh, while you're already writing your funding application. Uh, and then what, what does this do all for yourself, for your career and so on? Let's be enthusiastic and positive, right? Uh, so uh, actually we start, we, we won a grant. Uh, we, we were finally successful. And again, what Paula said resonates very much with my experience. I mean, I 
uh, I would say my success rate is probably 20%, even less. So uh, there's a lot of rejections along the way. And uh, if you don't keep at it, uh, you will never have this uh, experience of probably uh, getting a, a, a grant awarded. Uh, but now, uh, let's say you get the, the, the notification email. I, I remember this when I got the notification from the European Research Council, and it's, of course, uh, one of the happiest days uh, uh, professionally I can remember, but I also remember the week after uh, because uh, then a little bit of the headache started to begin in terms of uh, trying to figure out uh, uh, how to progress uh, with everything. So next slide, please. Uh, and this, of course, uh, comes down then also to what sort of grant it is. Smaller grants, of course, are usually uh, much easier to manage. Uh, you don't have large teams. Uh, the money is probably very... Uh, categorized in what you spend on going to conferences, what you spend on, let's say, data, research assistance, and so on. Uh, once, of course, you go on the longer uh, grants that, uh, that are beyond, let's say, two years, four years, five years, and so on, uh, it's, it's very difficult then to plan that much in advance. Uh, and it, of course, usually uh, will involve uh, people. If it's an individual grant, uh, you certainly will have probably PhD students, postdocs. Uh, if it's a collaborative grant, uh, like the Big Horizon uh, collaborative project, uh, uh, of course, there's other difficulties in terms of managing a consortium uh, and so on. So all of those things uh, will probably determine how do you write the grant in the first place. Uh, what determines uh, then the next steps, and again, this links very much back, uh, the finances you proposed, uh, uh, the people you need, uh, and after all, uh, physical infrastructure seems to be something that's the least of your concern, but it is. Most universities don't have uh, large project rooms uh, that are just uh, staying empty, uh, all those kind of things. So infrastructure is a, is a significant consideration. Again, uh, before you even start applying, it's worthwhile uh, to, to figure that out. Uh, as uh, Once you have the grant, uh, it's usually very difficult to negotiate uh, uh, additional things. So, uh, Best case scenario, again, uh, you applied for the grant, you had a budget, it's approved, no further questions will be asked. Uh, on smaller grants, that's most likely the, the case. On larger grants, uh, definitely not. Uh, the funding agencies usually come back to you, uh, will probably ask for further justifications. I remember when I got the ERC awarded, uh, I got that email a week later, uh, and uh, it required a 12-page write-up uh, justifying my budget for the next five years. Uh, needless to say, that took me about a week, a week and a half to do that. Uh, so uh, think about that also in terms of your cost categories. Uh, uh, usually you don't get just a lump sum. It's uh, it's dedicated to personnel costs, non-personnel costs, all those kind of things. It's sometimes very difficult to shift between categories. Uh, so be prepared to defend your budget. Uh, again, keep that in mind when you're writing already your grant. Uh, what about uh, open access fees, uh, 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 conferences, all those kind of things? Well, with plan S, with uh, environmental considerations, uh, build this into your thinking. On the one hand, of course, you have to disseminate your research. You want to participate in, in, in projects and conferences. On the other hand, uh, that budget item might uh, be smaller and well justified. Uh, so again, uh, look at what's uh, specifically uh, required in terms of your offer letter from your from your awarding agencies. Uh, an ERC offer letter is uh, well over 100 pages. So uh, needless to say, uh, it takes again a very long time to study that to understand that there's a lot of leg legal stuff in there and so on. Uh, internally, uh, uh, 
might seem like, well, that's a slam dunk, right? Because your institution, your university should be extremely happy uh, that you receive the grant. Uh, they usually get overhead payments. So uh, on an ERC, it's typically 25% of the total sum goes to the host institution. Uh, and of course, the idea is that they facilitate the space, the support in terms of HR, finances, and so on. Uh, of course, they will say they do that, but uh, please be careful. Uh, again, uh, it's worthwhile to talk to the finance people up front, to talk to HR, uh, what will be provided. Uh, a loan advertisement for jobs uh, uh, could run into the thousands if you want to put it up on the international jobs sites uh, and so on. Uh, also similarly, uh, does uh, your institution provide uh, training, uh, free training in terms of, uh, of uh, project management skills, administrative skills, IT skills, all those kind of things. Uh, if they don't, uh, you have to organize that. Uh, and again, this will of course significantly impact on your time and uh, on, on, on your budget. Uh, and then, of course, also uh, in terms of uh, how will your career progress in terms of having, let's say, uh, two, five year long grants uh, probably won't allow you to go on a long sabbatical or uh, do other big administrative jobs uh, uh, inside your department, your university and so on. Uh, again, uh, manage the expectations up front. So when you say I'm applying for an ERC or another larger grant, uh, talk to uh, to your head of school, your chair of department and so on uh, and see what will be offered in case you are successful. You first, your people first. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, uh, again, your institution will be initially ex extremely excited that you got a, a bigger grant and that they get the overhead payment, but uh, they might not uh, uh, remember that later. So whenever there's agreements, uh, uh, I would suggest have them in writing in some sort or another. Uh, people change jobs, so your head will change, uh, your college principal might change, uh, whatever was discussed and agreed upon, if it's not really formalized somewhere, uh, it's worth very little. Uh, so uh, think about that because you could get into a situation where you have a large project, uh, postdocs, PhD students, uh, you're required to do a full, uh, a full course load teaching, uh, maybe some admin jobs at the departmental level, it's too much, okay? Uh, so uh, also in terms of HR, it's very important, especially if you have postdoctoral fellows and so on on your projects. Uh, uh, very frequently, they are international. Uh, it might require hosting agreements, all those kind of uh, things uh, you probably wouldn't know anything about and uh, you probably shouldn't know that much about because it's not really what you do. And uh, and again, having good contacts uh, or contact points uh, is something very important uh, there. Uh, and this, of course, all translates onto your people because if it's well set up, uh, if there's a strong institutional support, uh, of course, uh, then they will have all the tools to progress in their own respective early careers. And you will be measured. I mean, uh, the success of a project, uh, of course, is measured probably a lot by outputs in terms of publications and so on. But if your people go on and secure their own faculty jobs, uh, progress in their career, of course, it will reflect back on you. And if you don't have the support, you can't do that. Team synergies, so space is very important. Again, if you have a smaller grant, uh, you're probably less concerned, but if you have a team of postdocs, PhDs, uh, so this will be a, a significant issue, maybe for, for some people, uh, especially if the institutions are very limited in space and so on. IT support, uh, nowadays, uh, very important. It's not so much anymore just providing a laptop. Uh, of course, uh, shared uh, drives, uh, uh, 
a procurement system, all those kind of things, again, should be managed from the higher education institution or wherever you, 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 you host that uh, in terms of your award. So keep that in mind. And also, again, it will impact your, your budget, right, from the onset. So when you write your grant and those things are not in place, uh, you have to put those into a budget as you won't be able to ask them ask for them at a later point and then also uh dissemination i mean uh is is a, a green access gold access uh required uh i mean publication fees go up in the range of several thousand euros uh and uh, again, you, you want to think about that because if it's a legal requirement in the offer letter and you did agree to it, the funding agency will come back uh, and you might have to find the money somewhere else. Day-to-day -day operational considerations. Uh, so again, uh, uh, you put forward a work plan that's probably very top level. Paul already said that, uh, that you, you write grants in a more broader perspective. Uh, you don't provide too, too much detail because then you're locked in. On the other hand, when you have to manage it, uh, you will be forced to be very detailed. So uh, have, have even something in back of your mind when you apply for a grant, how do you will how will you do the management on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis and so on, uh, how you will organize it very efficiently in terms of share calendars and uh, uh, project management uh, uh, software, possibly all those kind of things. Uh, some of them are free apps, uh, very useful uh, and something to consider. Uh, Reporting, again, uh, reporting, I suppose, will only be of concern once you're awarded, so maybe not in the, in the, uh, in the grant writing process, uh, but it is something you should uh, consider from the onset, uh, because those deadlines are approaching, they're usually substantive, uh, and uh, if there isn't good note-taking, uh, all those kind of things along the way, uh, you might miss out uh, uh, in terms of uh, really uh, showing the breadth and the, the, the kind of uh, achievements of your of your grant. Uh, uh, also, in terms of end of project uh, uh, tasks, uh, uh, if it's larger projects, they usually need to be audited. Uh, if uh, audit fees go also in the range of thousands of euros, if it's not written into the grant application in the first place, uh, you institution would have to pay for it. If the institution is very cheeky, they might take it out of your other research budget. So again, uh, something uh, to keep in mind and also uh, the idea to separate between financial reports and scientific reports. Of course, scientific ones you are in charge financially, you might need uh, the assistance from the finance department and so on. In terms of, uh, of course, leveraging your grants, uh, 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 and Taniela mentioned that I had an, uh, an, an RSA uh, early career grant, uh, I leveraged that for an ERC. So uh, necessarily don't go big just from the onset. Uh, it's sometimes very good to, to have a few small successes uh, and uh, then leverage them uh, to something uh, bigger. Also, make sure uh, that you're known as an expert in your field. So, uh, of course, there's a lot of talk about interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, uh, but by the end, uh, referees will usually uh, look especially on the larger grant applications well is that somebody who is uh, known in the field who has uh, ample expertise all those uh, kind of things and then finally uh, also uh, remember a grant uh, in your professional career is obviously one thing and uh, and it shouldn't use up 100 percent of your time uh, uh, it's usually written into the grant, your time commitment uh, on ERCs. It could be anywhere between 50, 70 percent. Smaller grants might require you to spend a minimum of 20 percent of your working time uh, uh, and treat it as such uh, because the grant will come and go. Right. Uh, but your career will progress. Uh, so in terms of also uh, your, your life situation might change. Uh, uh, all those kind of things. I mean, nobody could foresee the pandemic, for example, uh, and obviously uh, funding agencies were very flexi 
flexible on those kind of things, but there might be other issues at hand uh, you want to consider. Again, study your offer letter because it will say uh, if you want to go on maternity leave, those kind of things, can the grant be uh, uh, held uh, uh, and, and prolonged non-cost uh, uh, no cost extensions are usually fairly easy, uh, although they have to be applied early. Uh, so that's the rule there. So those are all kind of uh, things. Last slide, please. Uh, uh, and hopefully they they will help you to think uh, uh, in terms of more the technical aspects when you do the grant writing. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Dieter, for this very rich presentation with lots of pertinent um, points to consider. In case in the audience people are thinking of applying for large grants, um, keep in mind that the RSA is regularly involved as dissemination partner in, in larger grants. So just reach out and, and let's have a chat about how we can support your work. Um, we are slightly overrunning, but do not worry. We just stay on a bit longer, if you don't mind. Um, our third speaker, third and final speaker, is Ekaterina Shakina. She is the um, assistant professor in economics at Northumbria University. And uh, Ekaterina is involved in a funded um, research project that has an applied purpose and is related to retaining the local workforce in Northumberland. Northumberland is a county in the northeast um, of England. Ekaterina, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Daniela, for introducing me. I'm very happy to present today. I'll share my slides. Uh, just a second. Uh, right. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to present today and share my experience of uh, getting funding and writing applications for funding. Uh, my presentation is going to be probably a little bit different from previous two presentations because I'm going to talk specifically about the project that I've done, because I believe um, the, the, the success of my application for funding was really related to the results of the project I've made. Um, so that's why I, I, I speak, a I'm going to talk a little bit about the project itself, just to explain how did I present the results to the funder, what did I actually do to gain the extra funding for the project, um, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, I'd like to say a couple of words about the project itself. It's called Northumberland Workforce Review Study, and it's supposed to be um, devoted to investigating the issues related to Northumberland workforce. As Danielle already has said before, it was supposed um, to be a small local project, but in the end it appeared to be quite a big project because after the first stage of the project, I was made a principal investigator and um, I got some extra funding for the project. I uh, quickly seen one of the questions in Q&A section, and I've seen that one of the questions was related to how to become a principal investigator. So hopefully my presentation uh, will be helpful in that regard. So the project itself was supposed to look into the workforce of Northumberland, which is a county in northeast of the UK. And the idea was to understand what's actually happening with the workforce. So do people live and work in Northumberland or do they leave Northumberland? And if so, why do they leave Northumberland and what are the main problems related to it? And it's important to say that the project um, was funded by businesses. So it was not a... Um, a government fund or it was not provided by you know some large big funding institutions the funding was provided by the local businesses so the local companies that are uh, founded in northeast of the uk more specifically northumberland came to the university northumbria university and framed their request of uh, uh, of the of the project um, although the uh, the um, the, the the grant application uh, the, the the application itself was written by us so they uh, they came with a problem they were not completely sure what the problem is they just knew that there is some issue related to workforce so people are leaving the county but they were not really sure what can we look into uh, within that project so we did some preliminary research and we suggested our uh, our bid for that project uh, with regards to the funding that was available and um, it was approved. We have prepared the bid 
and only afterwards uh, we actually got approved uh, with regards to the funding. So the, the funding got approved and we uh, got the green light with regards to the project keep going. So my experience shows that sometimes writing research bid application is a lot about work to be done before actually you get the funding. And it's something that can grow in collaboration with the funder, which in our case were local businesses. So talking about the funding itself, the project had an originally the first stage and the first stage uh, was with a funding of 10,000 um, pounds. And the main aim that we have stated and that was confirmed with the funder was to analyze and address the skills mismatch in Northumberland County. So we were supposed to look at what kind of um, professionals are uh, living in Northumberland, what kind of uh, their professional background is, as well as to matches with the jobs that are available in the county. And for that, we were being provided £10,000, as I've just said. Um, the research bid itself was a uh, work in progress, and it was built together with the business, which was, I think, quite a unique uh, way of gaining the funding, getting the funding. And um, the length of the project was very, very short. Again, why? Because in this case, given that the funder was a business, they were interested in results and practical applications of our research. So they were not interested in, you know, very long ongoing research. They were actually interested in the results to be gained quickly. So the project was very limited in time, short in time. So we had to do a lot of work within those months of work. And the idea was that if we succeed during the first stage, there might be some extra funding for the second stage and there might be some extra funding for the third stage. So in 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 the time left for the presentation for me, I'm going to talk a little bit more what we did to actually get the funding for the second stage. How did we present our results? How did we sell our results? How did we communicate with the funder? And how, for instance, myself became the principal investigator is also part of that story. But originally, as I said, there was 10,000 uh, pounds allocated for the first stage of the project. And currently I'm the principal uh, investigator of the second stage, which has the funding of 12,000 pounds. I'd like also to mention that there might be potentially the third stage of that project. And again, the same principle applies. So depending on what we find in the second stage, we will see whether we will get extra funding for the third stage. In general, this project is quite an interesting and important project in terms of looking in the, um, into the workforce and what needs to be done for it to, uh, to keep or retain the workforce. So the next, in the next slides, I'd like just to show what we've done and how did we present it. But before I'm going to show it, I'd like to say a couple of words regarding um, uh, presentation of the results that you get within the project. So before all the previous speakers were talking about writing your application for the research funding, that's of course very, very important. But my experience shows that what's actually very, very important if you want to uh, change your role from just investigator to the principal investigator the in the future, or what is important if you want to get some extra funding is how you present your fundings, your findings to the funder. So this is very, very important. And that's something that I personally struggled with uh, because when we were presenting the results of our work, they were sometimes a little bit too complex to digest, if I may say so. So an important part of the work was to restructure the results, to make them clear and, and understandable and appealing to the funder, such that the funder would say, yes, that's very, very interesting. Yes, I really want to keep investing in this project. So we have found very interesting trends when we looked into the workforce. I'm not going to go into detail, just briefly mention it. But basically what we found is that there is a decline of a uh, young population in Northumberland and it's significantly higher than across the whole UK. We also found that um, people uh, in the age group 50 plus, um, their number is growing and this is higher in Northumberland than in the UK. And then we started to look into the reasons for that. Why does this happen? And what we have found is that basically young people are leaving uh, the county and um, people that are in 50 plus age group, they come to the county to leave. Um, to present that funding, uh, finding, sorry, uh, we have used a lot of visuals. So I just provided you here with a little slide of what we have presented. You can see that we used a lot of visuals, graphs, 
uh, we tried to uh, kind of we tried we tried to kind of uh, you know um, be very um, explicit in what we've done. Um, one more interesting thing we used we used as I said lots of visuals. For instance, that interesting visual shows you um, that younger people are leaving uh, the county and all the people are coming. And this was the slide that grabbed most of the attention of the funder. So after looking at it, the funder was so much curious about why does this happen, as well as so much interested in funding further stages that I believe was partially um, explaining the success and explaining why we actually did get the second, uh, get to the second stage of the funding just because of this slide and the next slide. So my message is try to present your fundings um, as visually supported as you can. Try to make it as appealing as you can. This might give you a chance to get uh, into further stages of the funding and to become principal investigators. So the next slide is again one of the slides of uh, our work. What we have found again, it's very visually appealing. It's very easy to understand. Although behind this slide, trust me, the, there are hundreds of pages of work and the uh, Excel uh, spreadsheets of work. But when you present it to the funder, try to make it look easy, understandable, digestible, appealing, interesting. I think this is the key of uh, this, the key uh, to the success. Um, if you try to get funding from businesses, they really like when the message is clear. They really like when the message is straightforward. They don't have much time to listen to your hours of results and presentation. They don't have that time. They have very limited time and they're interested in very specific results that could be applicable. Um, I'm not sure if I have more time, but I believe I don't. Anyways, uh, Overall, to summarize, I'd just like to say that working, my experience of working with a, a business as a funder was very interesting experience. Um, all my life uh, before I worked in academia, and after that, I realized that presenting my work at academic conferences and presenting my work to businesses are just two different worlds. But this is something that makes your work meaningful, because if you do that, you understand that what you do is actually needed. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ekaterina. We couldn't agree more. We find um, every time when we work with policymakers that it really involves two different communication skills, academic communication and um, applied communication to policymakers, or in your case, um, businesses and translating research. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Thank you for taking the time to prepare to being here. We really appreciate it. And I now move um, hand over to Sharon to manage the questions. And thank you for everyone to ask questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Daniela. And as one of the moderators of today's webinar, I would like to thank to our presenters, Paula, Dieter and Ekaterina. Uh, I have learned a lot as well. Your insights and expertise uh, have lit our discussion and I have collected some uh, uh, questions from the Q&A box. So now I would like to open the floor for questions and discussion from our uh, audience. First of all, Paula, I would like to address uh, two or three questions to you, maybe short answers if you would be able to provide us. So uh, you have talked about the application process. This, uh, From the both applicant and the reviewer perspective, can you a little bit elaborate? Does this initiating prior contact to the, express the, their interest, asking questions, does this improve the chances of success in the grant application writing from like both sides? And uh, about the resubmitting, it was really uh, motivating uh, to PhDs and uh, ECRs. Do you have any experience that you have like resubmit uh, a work that has been uh, not uh, uh, accepted in the first place and you would like to share? And maybe from El Hassan Ibrahim, is it possible or is there any website to get this sample successful grant applications? I know that you have shown the RSA and the previous uh, holders of these uh, grants. If you have anything also, our, uh, I will ask the same question to our other uh, uh, presenters. Yeah, floor is yours, Paula, please. Hey, thank you. Lots of questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick and I'll, I'll try. I hope I've written them down, so I hope I have them all. So um, in terms of 
whether it's more successful if you contact in advance, I don't think there's any clear way to say that. I think you can avoid a lot of really stupid mistakes. Um, I think it, it's less about getting into contact with, because you won't get into contact with future reviewers of your grant. You will only get into contact with sort of the admin around who is, who is uh, doing the application process. Um, and those might be the people who then kick out your application because it's too long, too short, missing half of it. And, and those are very frustrating reasons to be rejected for. Um, so in, in that sense, I think it's very valuable to contact if you have questions. Um, I think it, it depends also a little bit on, on which grant you're applying for. I think there are some um, places where you can apply where communication structure is very open and people are very happy to answer. Um, there's others where it might be more difficult. Um, in my experience, it's always been quite easy um, and quite helpful. So if there's anything unclear, I would definitely contact. I'm not sure if there's much to gain from from pre-pitching your idea because you won't get the person who then is actually in charge of it. Um, and you might actually just you know, annoy the people who are valuable to keep on your side. Um, in terms of resubmission, yes, I do have uh, an example. Actually, my early career grant for the RSA is a resubmission, something that we, what I, what I first uh, submitted uh, for the German Science Foundation as a much larger project. Um, and it was rejected there. And I was very sad because I thought it was great, a great idea. Um, but they, they, were, they weren't sure that I had enough expertise to, to do all of this. Um, so I narrowed it down. I took one part of it um, and I submitted it for an early career grant um, with a specific intention to then maybe build on it back and try again for a bigger project later. Um, so I think that that helps. Um, and it's, it's especially valuable for, for these type of smaller grants. When you have a, a larger plan that doesn't work out, you might be able to split it up into smaller things um, and, and find somewhere else that might be willing to fund it. Um, sample applications, I think most funders provide this information on who got the grant and what the topic of everything is. I don't think they usually publicize the actual application because there's a lot of confidentiality issues with that. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not aware of any place where you can just download examples for applications. Um, that being said, if you know people through your personal relationships, you might find somebody who's happy to share an example with you. So I think that might probably be the way to go, but maybe the others know more. Thank you, Paula. And for the audience, we are running a little bit late. So 10 to 15 minutes we are expecting. So my uh, second uh, group of questions will be addressed to Dieter uh, from uh, Milan, Aleisa and uh, Caroline. So what would you recommend to PhDs and early career researchers on taking the role of principal, uh, principal investigator? Do you have some tip for how to become the main investigator at a project as an early career? And what do you think about the seniority of the team in writing uh, grant application? And uh, which grant scheme would you advise for a small scale individual final research project within a PhD? Uh, and there are some specific up to 5,000 to 6,000 pounds, mainly for empirical data collection. And one more about the management of the grant. Could you expand a little bit more on the balance between giving detail versus leaving flexibility, also being ambitious versus showing the project is feasible? And uh, yeah, by managing a grant, there might be things that were maybe too ambitious or risky ideas that didn't work out and how you deal with it, this crisis management. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those questions. Uh, so I wrote them down. Hopefully I can cover them all quickly. Uh, principal investigator. Yeah, I suppose it first of all depends, right? I mean, uh, a lot of grant schemes are individual grant schemes like the RSA Early Career, the ERC. So uh, you don't apply as a team. So by default, you would be the principal investigator. If you, of course, are more uh, collaborative ones, uh, I see that this might be uh, an issue and that obviously uh, certain senior people will be put a hat uh, just to show the experience, the breath, and so on. Uh, there, I guess, uh, it can only be handled through individual agreements. Uh, I mean, uh, you do have senior people putting their name forward, but then happy enough if other people manage. Uh, uh, more parts of the grant. Uh, of course, if you don't get credit for it, then you do the work and yeah, you see where this is going. So it's a little bit of a tricky one uh, uh, in terms of seniority. Uh, 
uh, small scale grant schemes. Well, the RSA one, uh, it's not necessarily small, small. I mean, uh, we, we talk here, I think that the value was about 6,000 pounds uh, that was mentioned. Uh, so, I mean, it's worthwhile uh, to scan uh, web pages. So there's a few web pages that, uh, uh, that highlight what funding calls are out there. I mean, the, the first one would be the EU tendering uh, website. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of associations like the RSA obviously advertises their own grants, but might also sometimes provide information on other uh, 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 places uh, and so on. So it's it's wise to, to, to shop around, uh, especially on that segment below 10,000. Uh, there's a lot at offer. Uh, sometimes they are dedicated dissemination grants. Uh, sometimes they are dedicated finishing off project grants. Uh, so uh, I would I would say uh, searching uh, for those. Uh, in terms of providing detail and being vague, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, deli a delicate balance. Uh, uh, Remember, you have usually a risk and contingency planning type of table thing in your large, at least larger grant proposals. So uh, that's a good space to say, listen, I'm aware that there are certain risks, but I also have a plan to, to mitigate those uh, if, if necessary. Uh, it goes a little bit back also in terms of... Uh, trying to be successful with grant applications. It's it's very rarely that you get three exact experts in your field reviewing your application. It's usually more a multidisciplinary kind of type of, of, of framework. So uh, when when you put forward your, your ERC application or even the smaller ones, uh, uh, let's say in economic geography, it's probably not three economic geographers. It's it's probably uh, somebody who's more in economics, maybe somebody who could be even in history and so on. So obviously you want to make it very accessible. But on the other hand, uh, you, you want to put in uh, this kind of uh, emphasis that this is very very specific uh, to your field and and you are the expertise so it is a very delicate balance but uh, uh, it it serves two purposes to be more successful in terms of uh, referees that that might not be like fully experts in your specific area uh, but also later if you get awarded uh, that you have a little bit of flexibility in terms of what you deliver uh, and that was the last question. Uh, I think, uh, uh, never mind you, most funding agencies will not check up on your publications and so on. They go on metrics. So if you say, I published in those journals and this and that, uh, uh, that's on the academic side. Of course, what Ekaterina talked about uh, on the public uh, policy uh, firm side, it's exactly the other way around. I mean, they want results. They couldn't care less reading a 10,000 word paper. Uh, so so again, know your audience basically when you apply, I suppose that, that determines that. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Dieter. Thank you so much. Corresponding to what you have said, I would like to uh, address the question to Ekaterina. Uh, you have mentioned already in your presentation, but uh, how does the approach to this grant application writing differ when seeking funding from non-academic resources once again? This, what is the most unique element should be emphasized to maximize the success in this uh, such applications? Because you have talked about the visualization and how you uh, basically communicate what you're going to do, what you have done, anything else like appealing, the appealing basically works there. And also, second question, what were your experience with being an early career researcher and at the same time, this principal investigator role? So yeah, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'll probably start with the last question. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm early career researcher. Technically, I, I did my PhD in 2019. So I don't know how is it, I mean, in other countries, but as far as I know in the UK, uh, at least in my university, it's three years. So I'm, I'm mid, mid career researcher, but maybe in Europe it's considered, in other European countries, it's considered to be early career. Um, coming back to your questions, 
um, how do I find being the principal investigator? I'd say it's a lot of responsibility, but if you know the client, if you know who is the funder, you feel much, much um, better at, at end at ease. In the first stage, when I was not the principal investigator, I would say responsibility was even higher how I felt it because uh, I didn't really know them. I didn't really know the clients. I didn't really know whether they're ready to give any further funding or not. And they didn't know me. So as soon as I've presented my work, as soon as they've seen what I can do, uh, because um, I was a, an investigator, but not principal one, although I was quite leading on the project, let's call it this way. So as soon as they learned who am I and what do I do, they were more lenient to give more funding. And I think um, our relationship changed from we don't know each other to we know each other. So uh, that got much easier in the second stage. Um, which part, the second question was related to which part is the most appealing uh, for, should be the most appealing to actually get the second uh, tranche of funding. Um, I would say it really depends on the client. So what is their interest in this project? In my case, uh, the, the businesses that funded this project, they were um, interested in helping local work workforce to find jobs. So all my narrative was around it. So uh, as soon as you build your narrative around things that are interesting for the funder, uh, you should be on the safe side to get more funding for the future stages of the project. And coming back to your first question, which parts are the most critical? As I've just said, visualization is critical. Keeping things simple is critical. Um, communicating face to face with a funder, I would say. You can have millions of meetings online, but what I found to myself is that it's not really working with businesses. You really need to meet those people. Maybe you should organize a small lunch or uh, just a small tea break after what you whatever you present. But you really need to to meet with them face to face to talk to have discussions. They're usually quite busy people, so it's really hard to find uh, a time slot in their schedule so that everyone would be present. But my experience again shows that success of that kind of research projects is around making everyone participate because then you really understand what they want. At the beginning, when I started working on this project, I had absolutely no idea what's what's exactly is expected from me. Or let's say our expectations were very different. My academic uh, experience and background was just not matching with their non-academic expectations and background. But over time, we kind of came to the point of agreement and understanding, I'd say. Yeah. Thank you so much, Katerina. Yes, slowly we can wrap up, I think. And I would like to thank again the speakers, Paula, Dieter and Ekaterina for your time and for your uh, very uh, full of knowledge presentations and your responses. And to organizers, yes, RSA, thank you for this fruitful collaboration again. Uh, stay tuned. We are having two more. We are meeting tomorrow, hopefully. And uh, next professional development series webinar tomorrow, please be sure that you are uh registered and uh, for more information you can check both rsa and esop uh, young academics network websites and thank you for your time and for your uh, participation goodbye